Good morning. Okay, I'm supposed to show objectives, etc. I think you all know about that part. Um, interesting, such a small world, I have to reach out, is that when I first started, I started in New Hampshire, and then we moved out to the Reno area. And Bob, the previous speaker, uh, was a manager at a hospital in Reno, Nevada, and he hired me over the phone. And I was there for 22 years. He had left after a year or two. And now I've moved down to Florida, and lo and behold, he lives in the next town from where I moved to in Florida. And we've reconnected after all these years. I, we had never, as far as I knew, when he left Reno, he fell off the face of the earth. But it is such a, a small world, uh, despite all the hospitals that we live in, that I constantly bump into people. When I worked for Hamilton and now for Percussion Air, I go all over the country and I keep running into people that I've worked with at some point in my life. So. Uh, potential conflict of interest, I'm a clinical specialist for percussion air, and um, you can read those, I don't have to read them to you, but um, if some of us out here probably remember Dr. Bird and the Bird Mark 7 IPPB, well IPV is the evolution of IPBB from Dr. Bird, so um, some of you, this is going to uh, take you back some memory, but uh, others probably saw IPVB in textbooks. So I like to say this, if this was the only way to fly, then planes would have to do this, right? <laughs> the takeaway is, think outside the box. You know? um, and I liked what uh, Dr. Neil McIntyre said yesterday, just because something doesn't have a lot of uh, research evidence does not mean that it doesn't work. It just means nobody's bothered to do the research although there is a lot of research actually with what I'm going to talk about today. Principle theory uses sliding venturi. So the way IPV works, it's a unique, interesting uh, uh, product in that it uses what's called a uh, venturi module called a phasotron. And it works on the uh, simple physics. It utilizes Bernoulli's principle and Newton's third law of motion to adjust resistance and compliance of the lung. So this is a technology that we actually call high-frequency percussive ventilation. You can use it as a therapy, which I'm going to focus on today, which we call IPV, interpulmonary percussive ventilation. And then you can use it as a form of ventilation. And we have a high, what they call a high-frequency ventilator called the volumetric diffusive respirator. And that you use as a ventilator. Um, and it uses the principle of high-frequency lamina flow to create sub-anatomic tidal volumes on average between, actually between a half an ml up to 50 ml per pulse. Um, and this device is used and is FDA approved for premature infants to the largest adult. Um, these micro tidal volumes combined with a high frequency anywhere from, with the therapy device it goes from 100 to maybe 300, um, goes up to 900 on the ventilator. And it creates what's called a counter cur uh, current flow throughout the tracheobronchial tree all the way down to the alveolar sacs. The benefits of this, and the key part here is this accelerated high frequency, not high flow rate, lamina flow, is it creates this lamina flow, a smooth flow versus turbulent flow. And it's well known that with lamina flow, uh, creates a convex or arrow shaped leading edge, tends to travel down the middle of the conduit. In this case, I say conduit being tracheobronchial tree because this concept of lamina flow versus turbulent flow is very well known in the mechanical world. If you were a hydraulic engineer or uh, worked with gas uh, delivery systems or fluid dis delivery systems in the mechanical world, they're always looking about lamina flow. They don't want to have turbulent flow. And it's interesting as I started working for percussion here more, if you study anything in cardiology, they talk about, in cardiology research, lamina blood flow versus turbulent blood flow, and you don't want turbulent blood flow. But it seemed when we went to the respiratory system, which still deals with gases and fluids, that lamina flow versus turbulent flow is not discussed. And conventional ventilators work with turbulent flow, um, and we seem to have forgot about lamina flow. Um, it flows more easily through the smaller airways. This, this uh, lamina flow is much uh, more fluid, much more organized, and it tends to flow through the smaller conduits. So when you have inflammation or congestion and you start to get smaller airways, this flow is actually able to go easier through those uh, smaller passages in your airways. 
and help to reinflate underinflated or collapsed alveoli or your atelectasis. This is just talking a little bit more about this laminar floor because this is actually very key to how this, this device works, this technology. And the key component to high-frequency percussive ventilation is what we call the phasotron. On the left is the version for therapy, and on the right is the version for uh, the latest version for the ventilator. Um, they both use a sliding uh, uh, venturi. Um, here you can see it's clear. Here it's the same thing, and here it's just covered by the, the you can't see it because of the white uh, plastic. So it's just pure simple physics how this device works. So it works by injecting little amounts of flow at a high rate. And of course, we know flow over time equals volume. So these are little micro volumes that are going down. And whether you're using it as therapy or as a ventilator, uh, it reacts to resistance. So this device, whether you're giving a treatment to a patient with a mouthpiece or a face mask or maybe directly to uh, endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube, it is not going to push a specified volume. It looks at the resistance or back pressure built up in the patient's airway or their mouth, and this drive flow it slows down because of the Bernoulli effect. That increase in the speed of fluid occurs simultaneously with a decrease in static pressure or a decrease in the fluid's potential. This part here, Newton's third law of motion, for every two bodies exert forces on each other, these forces are equal in magnitude or opposite in direction. We normally say that one is for every action there's an opposite and equal reaction. That's this part here, the back pressure slows down the Bernoulli effect. Instead of pushing more gas into the patient's lungs, it actually exits through this port, which is normally an entrainment port. So when you're doing a therapy, unless you put extreme settings into the IPV device, it is automatically adjust pulse to pulse to the resistance or what is going on in the patient. It's not going to give them a large breath, even though when you first start to take a, a treatment, it kind of feels weird. And most often people think, oh, it's going to pop my lung until they relax and realize it's not. Because of this, it's not going to overinflate the, the uh, lung. It's not moving. That's not working. <laughs> it's always that way. Uh, sure. If, does the, the videos give you issues? No. Story of my life. So while he's working on it, I'll continue to talk. So IPV, you see we have two types we use generally in the hospital, called the IPV1C, and then that's a red box, and then the IPV2C, um, which is blue box. And we have a home unit uh, called the Impulsator, which is basically a compressor-based system using the same exact phasotron uh, for that. Um, Generally, with, uh, when you give an IPV therapy, uh, you don't have to use medicine, but we know in the field, you usually always, doctors are ordering albuterol or, or the Duoneb version. Um, but you don't want to give a treatment dry, obviously. Um, it's not hot, but you have, you're creating lots of little cool flows. And one of the things you want to do is, this is very effective at bringing up secretions, and we don't want to cool off those secretions or dry them out. So if you're not using uh, m any medicines, you want to use normal saline at least. So this is shown here. This is uh, the therapy device, and this is the ventilator. So I wanted to put this up. What this does is the difference between high-frequency percussive ventilation as a therapy and as a mode. If we're using it as a therapy, what we call this is a monophasic device. So it's using the same pressure going to the same uh, peak pressure or amplitude. But if you use it in the form of a ventilation, we call it biphasic. It has two pressure thresholds. The lower pressure is what you commonly call PEEP. And then the upper pressure, pressure threshold is the inspiratory phase. 
So as a therapy. So these devices are pneumatically powered. They don't need to have be plugged in for electricity. Um, and what they do is they inject micro volumes during both the inspiration phase and the expiratory phase. They're not dependent on active patient participation. So um, that's good. You have an active patient breathing with a mouthpiece or a mouth seal or a BiPAP mask. It works very good. But you can give this to a patient who is fatigued um, or if they're a quad, they're comatose, they have a trach. It doesn't require active patient participation to be effective. Um, can be also used in line on ventilators. Um, it loosens secretions and tends to propel them higher up in the tracheobronchial tree, enabling the patient to easily cough them out or for the clinician to suction them. And this is that counter current flow. The best way to think about it is these devices are going so fast that the volumes, the, the inspiratory volume is going down the center of the tracheobronchial tree and it's pushing this slower uh, gases and fluids to the side, but they're coming back out at the same time, creating kind of a counter, uh, like a conveyor belt effect. Um, and the lamma flow is able to easily pass through constricted bronchioles to reinflate alveoli and reverse atelectasis. Um, interesting to note, during COVID, remember we all heard, oh, we're going to ask uh, uh, automobile companies to help make ventilators. And that was in some instances. I know my old company, Hamilton, they had General Motors help them uh, improve their assembly line for assembly of their ventilators. We were approached by the Department of Energy, Los Alamos National Labs of all places, most famous for the atomic bomb. And they said, hey, do you got anything we can do for you? Because uh, they've stopped all of our projects. And if we don't have anything to do related to healthcare, they're going to furlough us through the pandemic. And so they did a lot of research with this technology and found out it's very effective, two things, at, at removing secretions and taking molecules much deeper into the lung parenchyma. And as a result, they're actually continuing the research into this technology for some things they're looking at above my pay grade. I don't even know about them. You can't walk into this several national labs. There's one in Idaho. There's one in Livermore, California. You have to have a FBI background check, and you have to be fingerprinted before they even let you in the front door. So I remember uh, my boss has, was walking through there, and the guy taking him through the, the Los Alamos National Labs was like, you can't go down that hallway. You can't go down that hall. He goes, I can't even go down that hallway. It's that classified some of the stuff they're doing. But anyways, um, we had, now are doing some research. We've been partnered with some pharmaceutical companies that are looking at about using this, con uh, this concept with some of the drugs to take drugs deeper into the lungs, such as lung cancer. So yes, there's a lot of actually independent study. It's, uh, even though it's listed as an airway clearance therapy, but it's more than that. It's a proven effect of reversing this atelectasis and restoring the function of residual capacity. If you go onto our website, percussionair.com, uh, there's at least 100 articles there, case reports, et cetera, and there's 54 independent peer-reviewed trials specifically about IPV, and some of them are demonstrating decreased length of stay, reduction in hospital readmission, uh, reduced length of stay in the ICU, reduction in ventilator-associated events, reduction in time on a ventilator, um, and assisting in weaning from ECMO. There's, there's case reports about that and a reduction in reintubation. This is a demonstration that was sent to us from a hospital. This is an endotracheal tube, and that was mucus, they let us know, donated by a cystic fibrosis patient. They wanted to make sure we know how viscous that is. And that's an older version of that, a reusable phasotron, but that's what you get, whether it's an endotracheal tube in an event, or if you're um, doing a treatment either with a mouthpiece or directly to the trach. It was interesting to note, and I've already sent these in here, but uh, just the other day, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't called, so we're sold in Europe, and I was uh, sent an email from an associate of mine in Germany, and uh, they had a young man come into the ER at a hospital there, and he had aspirated his chewing gum, and he was coughing up a storm and could not get it up, so he came to the ER, and they thought, okay, we're going to have to bronch him, and... Uh, uh, to get it out. I actually called, his name's Bodo, I called him because I didn't believe it, I wanted more details. And one of them said, you know what, let's try the IPV, we know it brings out secretions like crazy. 
I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't know this gentleman, but it got the, the chewing gum out. It moved it up high enough to where he got it up into the back, uh, like his carinal area, where he could cough it out. I wouldn't have believed it if I, if I hadn't talked to him. So this is just going through again how it kind of works. It's constantly coming down. So just like high flow nasal oxygen where you're rinsing out the anatomic dead space, except this goes all the way down to the alveoli. And it's very effective because of that lamina flow at gently being able to tease open your um, collapsed alveoli and reverse your atelectasis. I'm going to stop this for a second. This is a graphic representation of this technology. Bob Taro is a friend of mine, and he was teaching ventilation to pulmonary fellows. And they weren't quite understanding this counter current flow. So what he has here, this is a glass bottle. So this represents your stiff, low compliant areas of lungs. And actually, compliance of a glass bottle is zero. He's got some confetti in here. This is a filter just to keep the confetti from falling out. And below, he has a T-piece, our classic T-piece. To the side of that T-piece, he has a black, what we call Siemens test lung. And he first puts it onto a conventional ventilator, which uses bulk turbulent flow. And you are going to see everything going to the test lung. Nothing happens here. And then he's going to put it onto an earlier version of our phasotron, and you're going to see a marked difference. So let's see if I can get this to work. Take the whole thing. That's unconventional mechanical ventilation. So let's show the uh, circuit right here. Okay. So this is conventional vent okay. right now. Everything yeah, path to, of least uh, resistance to went to the healthy one. Okay. He needs a third hand here. See the difference? So this technology is able to ventilate both healthy lung tissue at appropriate volume and able to go into the very stiff, low compliant areas of the lungs. That's your counter current flow. Cool. And then how rough is IPV? I say, when you first do it, it feels kind of weird. But this therapy is used all the way down to premies. This was sent to us from a 100-bed NICU in California. And uh, I'm not sure of my slides. I haven't looked to see. They did a very good study, and I love this, because this was completely conceived and run by respiratory therapists. A very well thought out study. It was the first done as a poster at the ARC, and then it was published in the Respiratory Care Journal. And between 2014 and 2015, they gave IPV treatments to 217 babies from a 22 weeks through 29 weeks. And they wanted to see if they could reduce the incidence of BPD and the labeling of chronic lung disease and the need for oxygen at home on discharge. They had a 42% reduction. To put this in perspective, our vaunted ARDS and low volume strategy back in 2000 was a change of 8.8%, and that was considered profound and landmarking. They had a 42% reduction. And to date, they do this routinely, and we have more and more NICUs doing this. They've probably done 2,000 infants this way. Uh, they just use the mask from their resuscitation bag, and they actually give them a treatment. Um, and what I like, you can do a study, um, and you might say maybe there's something to it. I like to see if the study can be repeated. The same study was duplicated at St. Barnabas and Elizabeth, New Jersey, and at Maria Ferrari uh, Women's and Children's Hospital in New York, and they had similar results. So when you got three studies that prove it, there's probably something to it. This is another thing unique how this, like say, if you're worried about should I use this on a little 72-year-old grandma, this was sent to us from a hospital in Belgium. They routinely do this. They, if they feel the baby is a meconium aspiration, that's a nasal tracheal airway. It's not an endotracheal tube, and he's crying. They will take it to the delivery room if they, it's a mexting. And they don't intubate him, but they put it in there, and you can see the stuff coming out of his nose. So, Because I'm always asked, it seems initially rough, should I use this on this little girl grandma? I go, if this kid can tolerate it, your grandma can tolerate it. So, what diseases can you use with IPV therapy? 
really any situation where secretions or other endobronchial debris is an issue, smoke inhalation, pneumonia, COPD exacerbation, COPD has loved this. And we've seen reduction in people having that uh, frequent flyer syndrome with COPD that they were in the hospital just two months ago. They have the home in pulsator IPV and maybe once at most twice a year they end up in the ER, not even in the hospital, but in the ER. We had great success with this actually with the first wave of COVID. A lot of small hospitals, one that I was working at, um, with the first wave of COVID, you knew if you're going to get intubated, you know, it probably wasn't good. We were a small hospital where I was helping out with, and they were deathly afraid if they got a COVID and intubated, they wanted to transport them to a higher level of uh, treatment. Nobody was taking transfers, right? So when they got onto uh, high flow nasal oxygen, we started doing IPV therapy. And I did 10 patients that way before percussion gave me a call and said, hey, we need you. Um, out of those 10 patients, only one of them got intubated. And we saw that more when I came on with percussion air. And there was also in the American Journal of Case Reports, there was one published that same year out of Europe at a hospital where they had the same thing, running out of ventilators. So they had COVID patients on, on high flow oxygen. And they thought, what are we going to do if they get intubated? And they wrote about their first three cases where they started doing IPV to these COVID, that first wave of COVID, and all three of them were discharged home. So um, other situations, low lung volumes, trauma, post-op respiratory failure, uh, neonatal RDS, et cetera, et cetera. Works very good for uh, bronchiectasis. And you have, you've been following new research suggests that a lot of people that are labeled as COPD have underlying or undiagnosed bronchiectasis. And IPV therapy works very, very well for that. Um, bronchiolitis, I've used it a lot myself, where if you get these babies, and now the new wave is RSV and bronchiolitis showing up in pediatric wards. And I've used IPV if they get onto a ventilator, if they're intubated on. I've shown, uh, I was down in Huntsville, Alabama, where we first did it, uh, University Medical Center in Las Vegas. We did the IPV therapy in line for 30 minutes every 10 hours, and within 24 hours, they had the babies off the ventilator. There is one study out of Belgium, um, that, I want to say in 2018, where they did 39 infants uh, with bronchiolitis that weren't intubated. They purposely looked for them to be 24 months of age or less, and they did the usual one group got just uh, hypertonic saline, one group, they were doing what they call uh, assisted autogenic drainage, and one group got hypertonic saline with, through IPV therapy once per day, and they did a 15 to 20 minute treatment in 39 infants. And on average, they reduced the length of stay with these um, bronchiolitis infants that got IPV, they reduced the length of stay by one day by doing one treatment per day, not chip, one treatment per day. And of course, most of us are gonna do at least two, one per shift. So don't be afraid to use it on, on little kids. Contraindications, like everything's going to have contraindications. This is at absolute contraindications, untreated uh, tension pneumothorax, even more important, untrained or unskilled operator. Anything we do, especially if it is involving positive pressure, if you have an unskilled operator, you can hurt somebody. Um, relative contraindications, recent pulmonary hemorrhage, recent MI, active vomiting, etc. Uh, possible things. If you are an unskilled operator and you set it up wrong and you use way too high of pressures, you could give a pneumothorax. Um, some people have issues where um, they swallow gas. And that would be something you'd look for and maybe reduce or maybe uh, if, if they really need the treatment, you might want to put in or stop and, and have them burp so they don't have extra gastric distension. Etc. Increased cranial pressure, there's an asterisk next to that because actually they've shown, and there's a study on the ventilator version, the VDR, that uh, using the high frequency vent, they had less issues with increased cranial pressure with, with trauma patients than on conventional ventilation. So we still say, you know, it's something you should be aware of, but don't be afraid to use it if you have head trauma. And the same thing with um, recent uh, pneumonectomy or lobectomy. Maybe not the first day, but after a couple days, and you start out gentle like you would do with anything. And we've had great success um, with people with low baptes, pneumonectomies. There are even some areas where they like to use the high frequency vent version 
in the OR for surgery because of the high rate and low pressures, it actually stabilizes the lung better than if they're on an anesthesia machine. And so I have some areas where they're really good, uh, comfortable with the ventilator and they will take it and use it in the OR if they're doing lung surgery. Okay, so IPV therapy may look complicated, but it's not. The key point is adequate percussion or chest wiggle is the primary objective. Frequency is adjusted to meet patient's comfort and disease. And it can be given as little as 10 minutes, but longer treatment times generally allow longer times between another treatment. So, you know how it is, especially with COVID. We were understaffed, overworked. Uh, we suggest on average a 15 to 20 mi uh, minute treatment with the patient taking breaks. And if you're gonna use IPV therapy, it's different not putting down or, or saying it's better or worse than other devices, um, but have a box of tissues and a trash can ready because they will cough up stuff. I guarantee it. Um, but let's say you're, you're over uh, overworked. We suggest 15 to 20 minute with break, but if you do 10 minutes with maybe one break, as long as you have good percussion and you can auscultate it throughout all the lung fields, and I work with the patient say, I'm gonna gently turn up the pressure till you feel it's kind of almost all the way down into your stomach. You're gonna have an effective treatment at 10 minutes. If you get to where the patient's now comfortable, you're not overworked, maybe you're staffed better that day, and you start giving a longer treatment, you can, instead of going Q4, you can go to Q6, Q8. And that's what we normally see when you're not understaffed, is I will start out, first treatment, maybe 10 minutes, patient gets comfortable with it. After two treatments, they're more comfortable. By the third treatment, they, they're easily, they wanna do longer, 15, 20 minutes, and I can take it out to Q8 to Q10. Generally, when we do it that way, you're Q6 for the first 24 hours, Q8 to Q10, the next 24 hours, and by 72 hours, you're Q12 or PRN and, and DCing the treatment. Very rarely do I see people with spontaneous breathing patients go past three days. Just to go quickly over the two devices, so you would start with the 1C, this is called, and you're actually, it's called the operational pressure, but that's what you're gonna turn up. It's not, it, it shows in a dial PSI, but that is not what's going to the patient. It's just the pressure coming into the device. It's giving the pressure in sonometers. Um, you turn on a master switch, you, then you slowly adjust your operational pressure, and then the frequency, some of you have probably used this already, and we used to talk old school to, oh, you've got to rotate the frequency. You go first to, as you go to nine o'clock position, as if you're looking on the face of a clock, that's about 250 pulses per minute. Then you go to 12 o'clock, about 200, 225. But what I do actually is I work with the patient. Some patients like the rotation. Other patients will say, you know what, it's really comfortable and it really works for me if you keep it at this position. And once you work, find out what works for the patient, you don't really have to change the frequency. Have the adequate percussion, and then it's very simple. The next treatment you're going in, you're handing it to them, you're just turning on the master switch. The difference with the IPV2C, this was originally developed so we could do neonatal infants. Um, you preset your operational pressure, and then you have this green C knob, and that's how you increase or decrease the strength of the percussion. And then we also put on a, a, the yellow knob allows you to have what I call a static CPAP underlaying the system. And it's not either or. You can have the CPAP so that as you start to recruit alveoli, you can have it there so they don't de-recruit, but you can do the CPAP at the same time you're doing the percussion. So, works equally well with a mouthpiece or a BiPAP mask. Uh, this is a showing it with the BiPAP mask. And this is how I found was really good with uh, COVID patients because they were very fatigued. They didn't hold it, they couldn't keep a good lip seal. We do it this way and it was very, very effective. This is a friend of mine named Kip Kevin. He likes to always make videos with himself in it. So that's what, you sh that's what it, giving a treatment looks like, whether it's mouthpiece or mask. And as I talked about earlier, this was Los Alamos National Labs. You can actually go down here. This was their news release and read more about what they're, they're looking at. This is putting it on a ventilator. This was sent to us. This was down in uh, Bradenton, Florida, or Blake Medical Center. 
when they first trying it, this patient's on a ventilator, conventionally you might see the endotracheal tube, they got a chest tube on the right, and they couldn't resolve the consolidation on the left. They started IPV therapy in this case, it was on a ventilator. Generally, you tend to go longer on a ventilator because the patient's not saying, I need to stop and, and cough, you can suction. They gave a one hour treatment and that's what the difference was. I had this just the other day. Uh, we've been working with a new hospital up in Tacoma, Washington. They bought our ventilators because they were getting tired of having to send patients out from ECMO if they failed unconventional ventilation. And it was quite interesting. They just sent me uh, copies of their x-rays yesterday. They had a patient who was on a conventional ventilator for 10 days, multiple bronchoscopies. They couldn't uh, reverse the consolidation in the left lung, get the plugs out. They put them onto the VDR ventilator. 22 hours later, they were able to extubate them and put them on the high flow oxygen after being 10 days on conventional ventilation. This was another one. This was sent to us. This was another hospital. It was uh, uh, down the road from the uh, one I was just talking about in Tacoma. This was theirs. They started up with IPV therapy in September. This was after one week. This was with a BiPAP mask. Again, patient. This was one treatment on this patient with IPV. Uh, we really started to get our toehold, especially with the ventilator, the VDR ventilator, in burn units. So if you've ever worked in a burn unit, inhaled gases, a lot of ash, you need to clean that out. There's a high mortality rate with burn patients due to pneumonias, and the burn surgeons started to investigate this. Really, it started in the military, um, and they carried it over because a lot of your burn surgeons in, in uh, civilian hospitals got their start as burn surgeons in the military. And this was a patient who was a victim of, they had a kerosene heater in the house that tipped over, a house caught on fire. This is all ash and debris. They were eight days on conventional ventilator doing, generally, you, they'll tell you if you're using a conventional ventilator, you're doing bronchoscopies like every three hours doing massive lavage to try and clean out the lungs. They put them onto this VDR ventilator, didn't bronch them until three days later. That's the difference, just from the ventilator, not bronching at all. And this is where we really got a toehold. So in burn units, using the VDR ventilator, the patients will still die from other reasons, but they're not dying from pneumonia if they're on the VDR ventilator. Uh, IPV can be used in line on a vent at the Y or on the dry side if it's a neonatal size uh, circuit. As we know, they're, they're smaller. They don't have 1522 connection at the Y, so we recommend it on the, here if it's neonatal, but you can also do uh, pediatrics and adults that way. Um, if you put it before the, the dry side of the humidifier, you don't have to put anything in here because it's picking up all the humidity from the, the humidifier. Um, this works quite well. And like I said, I've done multiple patients around the country as I started talking and suggesting, uh, spe specifically with RSV and bronchiolitis if they get intubated. Um, they will do this. Uh, my first one I did was in uh, Huntsville, Alabama at our Women's Children's Hospital. It was our term infant, 12 days old, severe RSV, on a ventilator, 100% oxygen. They had bought our devices and I was there to train them, showed them how to do it. They did one treatment and then I went to another hospital to do an in-service. That was at 9 a.m. I came back at 4 p.m. and they had told me they did a second treatment on this inf infant at 2 p.m and they were down from 100% down to about 45% FiO2 after two treatments and extubated the baby the next day. Again, talked this already, do not give a dry treatment. Um, way ahead of schedule. Um, and it can be used at home. So this is the home unit. It's basically just a compressor um, attached and you use it pretty much like the red box. We're seeing success with this with your post-COVID long-haul patients recently. We've had uh, reports coming back where, in fact, I think that's my next slide, where patients that go home and they're on oxygen, they've been told you've got fibrotic changes from COVID, you're going to be on the oxygen the rest of your life. They're starting to use our treatments and they're getting them off of oxygen. So this was on Facebook. This was, I believe, in Georgia where um, the patient sent us the uh, CAT scans where he was on about five liters of oxygen. Above that, they started doing uh, the home care company. Uh, two weeks of IPV therapy, TID. He was off of oxygen. Now he's taking treatments at home, PRN. 
maybe he says he's every other day to maybe every three days then he takes a treatment but he's no longer on oxygen this was covid post covid so it works quite well on that other studies this one was looking at uh, COPD exacerbation. They were doing uh, BiPAP using the helmet. And before COVID, how many people knew about the helmet? Uh, this was actually in 2006 where they were using the helmet a lot in Europe. And they would take them off of the uh, V60 and give them an IPV treatment. And they were doing it just twice a day. And what they found is they could get them out of the intensive care unit less time in the intensive care using by doing IPV, the CO2 was lower in the IPV group versus the control group, and their PF ratio was higher. So this is a one study, and there's several studies showing you can reduce the time in the IPV, uh, the IS, ICU. This is an interesting one. This was an ALS case uh, that was sent to us uh, from a patient in France who had ALS. They were uh, ventilator dependent. They got a bad pneumonia. As you can see, you really can't see the left lung, can you? Here's the actual picture of the patient. I apologize, they're small. Um, you can see they're normally on a trilogy vent. They had a cough assist. None of that was working. They started giving them IPV treatments with the IPV2C. In fact, they put it on for four hours. These boxes by themselves are basically like an emergency ventilator in some respects. They gave them a treatment for four hours and that was the result after four hours, and then they were able to put them back onto the trilogy vent. They got the, the consolidation and that left lung open. Uh, this was back in 2005. This was um, COPD again, uh, exacerbation. So they had two groups of patients getting the uh, just traditional uh, small volume nebulizer in meds and then one group getting the same meds, but through IPV therapy. And like I say, the Los Alamos National Labs has shown that this counter current flow that we talk about and the lamina flow brings molecules much deeper into the lung. So, and actually in the control group, six out of the 17 patients ended up getting worse. None of them got worse in the IPV uh, therapy group. And on average, the length of stay in the hospital was reduced by one and a half days, just giving two treatments a day. So questions. I like this. This is a little guy. This is what a lot of our NICUs are doing now. If they're on bubble CPAP, they will give them, and they start to have increased retractions, increased uh, O2 needs. In this case, this hospital has a lot of our VDR ventilators. They just plug them into the ventilator, non-invasive, using the flexi trunk. But other ones will take that IPV device, plug this, the bubble CPAP unit in there, give them a treatment, put them back on bubble CPAP, and they never end up filling the bubble CPAP and getting intubated. I like to put this one up because everybody likes those little kids. But again, if he can handle it and you saw he was quite happy, that little old grandmother can handle it. So usually I talk right up to my 60 minutes. I see we got 20 minutes left. Questions, comments, or derogatory remarks? Pardon? I'll let you there. To percussion air? Yeah. They called me and said, hey, we're looking for a clinical specialist. Do you want to be one? Yeah, <laughs> that's it. And there's a guy named Giles Wilson. Some of you might know him. And I, I texted back. I go, is this Giles Wilson? He goes, how many Giles do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, 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 uh, he's from England, so he's got that dry sense of humor. You had a question, Bob? Yeah. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid coverage? Uh, yes. Yes, I am not an expert in that, but we actually have a specialist named Patty McCulley, and she works with DMEs to get all, and uh, discharge planners to get all the verbiage right to get it covered. But it is covered, and we can, we've been working with some DME companies to put them in contact with her. So. And patient purchase options? Yeah, um, I've had uh, one, she was a general practitioner in Boise, Idaho. And she was seeing a lot of these post-COVID patients, and she just bought uh, the impulse editor out of her own money in her office, and she's having these patients come to her office and uh, give them treatments and getting them off of oxygen. Um, I had a husband and wife team in uh, Kansas City, Kansas. They were both physicians. He was a victim of COVID, and they just bought one outright. So we do have people doing that that are, especially with the long-haul COVID, they're just buying the machines outright. 
reason I mention that is that I just came across a, a large support group on a large in the country. I, I want to say they're called um, over, Overhaulers or something. I don't, I'll look it up for you. But basically, that support group and their position staff would be really welcome to this device. We're starting to get a lot of inquiries like that. And again, unfortunately, due to, to long haul COVID, but um, it's really um, changing some people's lives where they were told you're stuck with this the rest of your life. There was another question over here. Yes. Um, they work differently. So Metanab, right in the manual, says they do. They create an oscillatory pressure pulse. We are injecting flow. So flow over time equals volume. We're making small volume changes. Pressure pulse is not part of the equation. Uh, I'm not saying we're better or worse, but it works significantly different than what we do. And uh, they, they say it's IPV, but it doesn't work the same as IPV. Um, and I'm sorry. X-rays don't look the same either after a day or two long. Yeah. These are unsolicited. These people that uh, send them to us and go, wow, <laughs> this is what we saw. Um, so other devices like Acapella and I always say Aerobica and it's called, a, I guess it, I'm told it's Aerobica. And they work on a basic a oscillatory pressure, the vibrolung. The idea is you make a momentary stop in the exhalation phase to create a pressure pulse. This is injecting micro volumes. Other questions? Yes. yes. Uh -huh. um, I know with the IPDB, you had to have a good seal either with a mask or a patient that was cooperative. Can you do it with a cuffless tray and have air leakage around that? Yes. 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 So, so if it's a cuffless, it, um, it works, works really, really good. good. Sometimes, Sometimes we've had ones where they all, yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a cuff tray, but they have it down. Yeah. And, and so, so sometimes, sometimes we will suggest partially, partially inflating it if it has a cuff, because it just gives you a little bit more bang for your buck that way, but it works with cuffless trachea. In um, some areas, if you're using the ventilator version, uh, we would suggest deflating the cuff partially if you have an excessive amount of secretions. This will bring secretions up so much that some people during a meeting will go, I think I'm going to clog up my endotracheal tube. And we suggest deflating the cuff in that situation to get the secretions out. So it, it generally works uh, very well. Um, there's a case report, when you bring that up, it's interesting, is that um, this was out of uh, UNC Chapel Hill where they had an 11-month-old who uh, aspirated uh, lamp oil, like you use in decorative little lamps. Uh, they first put him on to pressure control, wasn't working. They put him on to PRVC, wasn't working. And this, you can get it off our website. We, you, you go to resources, studies, you can download these, these research. Then they decide they're going to try APRV, the child coded. They got him back, they put him onto an oscillator, was stabilized him, but he wasn't going anywhere. And they were at about eight days of this, and they told the family, child's not gonna make it, you might wanna call your, your minister or whatever. And then they decided they, that, hey, we hadn't tried the VDR. And it says right in the case report, as soon as they put him on the VDR ventilator, almost immediately and up to f almost four hours afterwards, the RT had to sit there suctioning all this exudate and these greasy gobs, which turned out to be the mineral oil. Um, child was on the VDR ventilator for two days, 48 hours, and then extubated after being eight days on conventional ventilation followed by high frequency oscillation and telling the family it wasn't gonna make it. So um, this, is, this is what we see commonly if you have a lot of secretion issues. So, other questions? Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you.